Hey everybody, I'm Barb and this is Knitted Squares, an intentional, interwoven online community influencing the world for Christ. On this channel, I share insights from God's living word, along with practical tips and strategies that I pray will help strengthen your relationship with Jesus. If you're new here, welcome aboard. I hope that you'll hit the subscribe button, and if you've already done that, go ahead and click like and share to help our influence reach as many as possible. Today, I'm talking about something that happens to all of us, some more than others, losing something valuable for which life stops until it's found. quick survey of things that we regularly lose, I'm guessing the following would make the list. Keys, phone, glasses, headphones, wallet, purse, remote. Have I included your frequent flyers? It's exasperating, isn't it? When you just can't find what you need when you need it. Some of you can't relate at all because somehow you always put it where it belongs and it's always there. But I know I'm not alone as one who spends too much time searching for lost stuff. Actually, most of it isn't actually lost, it's misplaced, because 99% of the time I end up finding it eventually. Sometimes what is lost is so critically important to the next step that nothing else can happen until the lost is found. A couple years ago, Bob, Stephanie, Cameron, and I were getting ready for a big trip, flying from Iowa to Kenya for a long-awaited much anticipated gathering of all of our Africa missionary colleagues. The tickets had been purchased weeks in advance. Our bags were packed. We were ready. And we needed to leave the house at 9 a.m. to get to the airport in time for our first flight. Bob made one last check of that folder that we keep all of our passports in to make sure that we had them. And Cam's was missing. Bob casually mentioned that it was missing, thinking that he would quickly find it. The rest of us continued on with our preparations for heading out the door in 90 minutes. Well, a half hour passed and there was no sign of it. I could hear Bob praying under his breath. And at this point I decided I better join in the search because time was ticking. We also enlisted Steph and Cam to help us scour the house, every room, drawer, counter, cushion. We looked in the cars. We checked all the pockets of our luggage. Still nothing. And now we were left with just 30 minutes before we had to be out the door. We were frantic. We were all praying as we searched. And if we didn't find this passport soon, Cameron and either Bob or I would have to stay in Iowa. That thought was crushing after how much we'd anticipated this trip. We were desperate. There were tears. As a last ditch measure, I said, let's come together and pray. We aren't getting anywhere on our own. We stood in the dining room, held hands. We began to call out to God together. We prayed in English. We prayed in the spirit. After a time of prayer, Cameron saw a picture in his mind of a stack of books beside our bed where we had all searched several times over the past hour. He left the circle, went to our room, and found his passport just where he had seen it in his mind's eye. There was great rejoicing, complete with tears of gladness, relief, and thankfulness to God for helping us to find what had been lost just in the nick of time, the passport that would allow the trip to go on as planned. Now, we all know that there are eternally lost, unriched people, billions of who have never heard that there's a God in heaven who loves and forgives and redeems. Maybe you are like me and you are so aware of the size of the unfinished task of worldwide evangelization that you suffer from paralysis by analysis. Not knowing what to do, we sit and we do nothing. We reason, there are so many lost, I'm only one person, what could I possibly do, what difference can I make? And paralyzed, we sit. Well, this week I was reading again in Luke 15, the three parables that Jesus told to help us understand the desperation of the Father's heart for eternally lost people. Interestingly, each of these stories is not about reaching masses, but about reaching one, one lost sheep, one lost coin, 
one lost son. The first scene is of the sheepfold of 99 happy sheep grazing, ha grazing happily. But one was gone, and this was a huge problem for the shepherd. He could not rest or move forward until the lost one was found. And when he found her, she got a shoulder ride home and then a big party for all the shepherd's friends. This was a big deal. The second scene takes us to a home where a desperate woman is sweeping desperately to find one valuable coin that has gone missing. She's got most of them. She's close, but close only counts in horseshoes and hand grenades. She cannot rest until she finds the one. And she, when she finds it, what happens? Yep, rejoicing with her friends. It's a big deal. The third scene unfolds out on the ranch. The younger son doesn't just wander off. He rebelliously leaves, bringing great shame on his father and his family. This lost one intentionally got lost. He inflicted such agony on his father. Every day the father was hoping and watching and waiting. How do we know it wasn't business as usual for the father? Well, because when his son was still a long way off, the father saw him. He was looking constantly. And when he caught a glimpse, he ran to meet him. And then what, scolding? No, just like the other two scenarios, great rejoicing and a party for all the friends. These three stories show us the intense love that God has for the one. God's redemption is for the whole world, but the whole world, one soul at a time. Who will reach the one soul over which the Father longingly waits to rejoice? Hmm, reaching one. Now that's something I can get my head around. This is something I can do. Every person that we meet is literally one in a million, one in a billion, and each one is worthy of the lavish, eternal love of God. Are you desperate to reach one? Are you searching as desperately as you search for lost keys or a lost phone, or as in our case, that lost passport? I confess to you, I don't use that desperation. I'm much more casual about it, but I don't want it to be this way. There are no higher stakes than that of a human soul that hangs in the balance between eternal life and death. My intentional prayers and my intentional efforts are powerful in the spirit to bring souls home to the Father, one at a time. I read an insightful article this week that challenged the thought that I've had that most people already know about Jesus. They just don't want to follow him. Being from the Midwest in what used to be called a Christian nation, there are churches on every corner, TV and radio stations broadcasting the gospel 24-7, and the internet is accessible to most. So I wrongly assume that people know about Jesus. But this assumption is where missed opportunities begin. The author of this article, which I will link to in the description below, says, the more Jesus is assumed to be common knowledge, the less people know. Isn't that the truth? We assume they know, so we don't speak up. I was talking to a friend this week about her daughter, who used to be a prodigal. While off in the far country, she moved in with her boyfriend, which she knew was wrong, but she wasn't concerned about such things at that point in her life. Her boyfriend, raised in the same wholesome, God-fearing Midwest as she was, had no idea that cohabiting before marriage was wrong. He had no idea who Jesus is. You see, everyone doesn't know. And when someone in his girlfriend's circle told him about Jesus, he readily repented of his sin, married her, and both of them are thriving in Christ today. We hear a lot these days about our rights, and we are passionate about no one infringing on them. I submit to you that it is the right of every human being to hear a clear presentation of the gospel so that each one can decide for himself or herself what to do with the gospel that brings salvation. So I have two action steps for us today. First, actively seek opportunities to share the gospel. Be bold. Don't be ashamed. It's the power of God to save our friends and family from eternal separation from God. Don't assume they know. And action step number two, equip yourself with how to share the gospel. 
Be prepared with an answer for why you believe what you believe. Know key scriptures that the Holy Spirit will use to convict of sin and righteousness and coming judgment. That's his job. Yours and mine is simply to share. We all carry our phones along with us. It's super easy. Just pull up your notes on your phone if you're worried that you're going to forget. I have saved as a note an image of the bridge so that I can walk someone through it whenever, wherever. There are countless other ways to share the gospel. Find one that is comfortable and works for you. But more important than the way that you tell it is that your testimony is part of it. What has Jesus done for you? How is your life with Christ different than without him? Hebrews 12, 15 admonishes us with our responsibility. It says, see to it that no one misses the grace of God. For those in my circle of influence, I have a responsibility to share the good news. I have a responsibility to live my life as salt and light. I am to see to it that they have heard. I am to seek and to save the lost. Not that I can save anyone, but I can introduce them to the one who can. And don't do this as a lone ranger. Join forces with the believers that you are knit together with. Remember my story of Cam's passport? God revealed to us where it was when we joined together to pray. Out of that corporate prayer, the answer came, the lost was found. Same thing with lost souls. I believe that as we intentionally pray for the lost, with those in our small groups, our families, our Christian co-workers, godly soccer moms, anywhere else two or three are gathered together, God will lead us to them. We will likely not reach the masses, but one by one, souls will come to Jesus, and there will be great rejoicing in heaven. Join me in prayer that God will forgive us for being casual or lackadaisical or indifferent when it comes to sharing the gospel, and that he will fire us up to take seriously our responsibility to see to it that no one misses the grace of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this amazing grace that you have lavished on us. Thank you, God, that you have opened our eyes to see you, to see your goodness, to see your glory, to see salvation. Thank you, God, for this relationship that I have with you. Thank you that we share an intimacy, an eternal bond, that we are in covenant together. And God, thank you for this reminder that you are passionate for the one. God, help me as well to be for the ones that I encounter on a daily visit, daily basis going about my walking around life. Help me to see them through your eyes. Help me to be prepared to give that answer to anyone who asks. Help me to live my life in such a way that it creates hunger and thirst in others for this relationship with you that I have. And that's what I pray for everyone watching right now. The passion, the preparedness, the being tuned in, being sensitive to your spirit to do what we need to do each day to bring lost souls home to you, God. That's the passion. That's the cry of our hearts. Let it be so. Bring them home to you, God. Use this community of knitted squares to join together in prayer and believe in you, God, to bring them home to you. Father, give us a fresh anointing and help us to do your work, your will, and your way, and have so much fun doing it, bringing people home to you. In the mighty name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Hey, thanks so much for listening in today. I pray, first of all, that anything that is lost or missing in your world, maybe it's your keys, your phone, your wallet, I pray you'll find it. And when you do, hey, shoot me a message. Let me know that God answered our prayers. I also pray that people in your circle who are lost will be found and that God will use you strategically and beautifully to bring them home. I'd love to hear from you about this too. And be intentional to actively seek the lost and have your answer ready for anyone who asks your reason for peace and hope. Knit yourself with others who desire to make Jesus famous in your town and together influence others for him one at a time, and be ready to rejoice greatly and celebrate extravagantly when lost souls are found. Now, that's a party I don't want to miss. I'll see you next week.